Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Data Diversity webinar, Activate Your Data Lake House with an Enterprise Knowledge Graph, sponsored today by Stardog. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights of questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, Zoom defaults to chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change it to network with everyone. And to find the Q&A or the chat panels, you may click those icons found in the bottom middle of your screen. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Naveen Sharma. Naveen is pres Vice President of Product at Stardog. He is a highly regarded data management expert and seasoned product management executive and has helped organizations achieve significant growth with new product innovation and adoption. Among other positions, he has served as VP product at both Precisely, Formula Releasing Sort, and Pitney Bowes. And with that, I will give the floor to Naveen to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. A uh, quick voice check. I assume you can hear me clearly. Yeah, you sound good. <laughs> All right, super. Let me uh, go ahead and share my machine. This will stop others. Yep, continue. Okay. Uh, let me put this in slideshow mode. Perfect. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, this is Naveen Sharma, as Shannon mentioned. I'm from... Uh, Stardog. I run product management, product strategy, tech alliances, and partnership here at uh, Stardog. Uh, basically dialing in from a very cold and rainy day here outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, but let's just get right into the topic at hand, which is how to activate your data lake house with an enterprise knowledge graph. Uh, key items, uh, just from an agenda perspective on what we will cover today, uh, really talk about the promise of cloud data warehouses, data lakes, and lake house. A um, lot, lot of discussion uh, in the data and analytics domain in space about, uh, you know, the best way to organize data, the best way to modernize data and analytics, uh, especially as more and more organizations think about, you know, utilizing the value and the benefits of shifting storage and compute uh, into the cloud environments uh, across different um, cloud providers. Uh, what are some of the benefits of having that data hosted there? Of course, uh, where you know we focus uh, our time and energy on is you know what's the what's the real value and in, in terms of delivering that last mile, where companies are looking to democratize data you know, across to a whole host of users for a whole host of use cases and how knowledge graphs that power a semantic data layer really play a part in that. And to make it a little real, we'll, I'll, I'll talk about um, just a, an industry use case. Uh, in this case, I'm, I'll touch on life sciences. By no means, this is limited to any specific industry, uh, but it will give you a, a perspective of how a knowledge graph powered semantic layer built on top of a lake house environment can actually really start to generate value for your users. Uh, so they can drive, you know, meaningful insights, more timely insights uh, in terms of, you know, their day-to-day -day operations. And to keep it real, uh, I've, I've been told that this audience loves um, live demonstrations, so I will do my best to, uh, uh, to, to uh, so hopefully time permitting, walk you through an actual scenario how this comes to life as well. So, and we'll leave enough time for Q&A. Uh, so we'll jump, jump right into the next slide. So again, uh, a lot of investment going into uh, data and analytics uh, domain, both within the enterprise, um, looking at ways to, you know, not only save on infrastructure costs, but also uh, get to a point where all data that is available can be leveraged to drive meaningful insights. And that's key because we know study after study, and this is just one of them, reflects the fact that research, you know, businesses that are actually built on those types of insights from data average at more than 30% annually in terms of, you know, their own growth, but also eight times more likely to grow faster than the global GDP. And this is, and again, this is, I'm sure you can find a study out there that you have read uh, that articulates the same, same set of uh, metrics. And of course, when we look at that, 
And really where most companies have started on that journey in terms of their modernization efforts, it's been to bring all that data in a place that you know, reduces the total amount of friction in getting access to all that data and doing it in a way that helps them derive insights that then can be turned into actions you know, inside of the enterprise uh, in terms of how, how they engage, when they engage, what products and services they offer. So when we think about it, really it's the, the adoption of cloud, looking at ways to reduce the amount of infrastructure that, need, that is needed to support and pay for that all upfront as a, as a capital expense versus looking at clouds in ways that you can actually, you know, turn this into more of an OPEX, uh, pay for what you use type of operation. Uh, and cloud has been, and has been a great, great driver of moving a lot of that data and analytics infrastructure away from, you know, more captified uh, data center type operations to, to more, you know, you know, publicly available cloud, cloud infrastructure. Storage is cheap. So why not bring any and all of that data uh, beyond just the infrastructure, bring all of that data in any form, structured, semi-structured, unstructured, and of course, operations like, you know, moving away from traditional ETL to, you know, ELT uh, with technologies out there that have made that easy to bring that information and data inside of those environments, inside of those environments have really, really, uh, boosted uh, you know, much of the, the movement of data into those cloud storage environments. Of course, the, the, the big thing there is with leveraging cloud infrastructure is you're also driving economies of scale with respect to what these cloud vendors are able to provide both in terms of you know, data ops, uh, you know, monitoring of data, operational of data, rolling out infrastructure, uh, you know, moving from test environments to production environments, utilizing elastic compute, uh, but also providing security at every level, you know, from data at rest to data in motion uh, and are able to do so and add and, and deliver those services, given the fact that, you know, many companies are able to leverage that infrastructure, uh, you know, in a sort of a multi-tenant uh, way uh, that, that promotes uh, the ability for these companies then to offer these services at a, at a much cheaper cost. And of course, this is also the basis of how, you know, rapid innovation is unleashed uh, because the focus is less on putting together this infrastructure, um, you know, it's it's more more automation there. Uh, focus on autonomous uh, and, and augmented intelligence I'll helps alleviate, you know, where where the time and, and energy is spent to to where the time and energy needs to be spent, which is in the analytics, in the analysis, uh, in trying to find you know new opportunities, new opportunities to innovate uh, with with a new product, new service. Uh, new feature and capability. Uh, and that, that's again, part and parcel to how data uh, is made available through these, through these cloud infrastructures. And again, you know, cloud data warehouses uh, is a come to, to come to life uh, in support of business intelligence needs. Uh, at the same pace, you know, we have introduced data lakes um, and the benefit of data lakes to support uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, to help uh, build, um, you know, more forward-looking models based on a lot more data that that uh, wasn't previously uh, always readily available is now readily available uh, to run those types of model development uh, and and uh, and then having those models actually be utilized inside of uh, enterprise processes and the business processes on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, understanding that this is a good start, uh, where we've also seen is where We've started to create this sort of dichotomy of, of value creation uh, where data, uh, while made available and simplified and cheap uh, in terms of your day-to-day -day operations uh, with cloud data warehouses, uh, you know, to, to drive your, your business intelligence needs, your reporting needs, and data lakes, on the other hand, to, to create that uh, the notion of machine learning and machine learning model development utilizing um, data in any, any form, uh, utilizing all data. Uh, we also created a, you know, a bit of this, this dichotomy where these two areas are really incompatible in terms of value creation. Um, and when I, what that really means is you know, we end up creating data sprawl, challenge, sprawl challenges because at the end of the day, you wanna move data 
to a data, cloud data warehouse to structure data a certain way to optimize your reporting and business analytics. But then if you wanted to move a lot more information for machine learning, you're creating more brittle ETL pipelines, uh, frankly, to, to you know, exacerbate the problem that, that you're now creating with multiple physical copies of the same data. And then in governance and security challenges that sit on top of that, uh, either have to be replicated, duplicated, uh, or, or oftentimes you know, not easily, not easy to, to um, operate across you know, both fundamental areas uh, of data and analytics. And then latency challenges that come along with slow updates. So anytime there's an update in your operational system, you're still moving data around into either a cloud data warehouse or a data lake. Uh, and then ultimately data quality is still questionable Yes, you've gotten data move, moving there faster than previous ways in previous times, but at the end of the day, uh, you still are not sure about how good and clean uh, and valid that information is uh, in order to, to be beneficial to your use cases uh, or your analysis. And so where they, you know, with the lake house architectures, you know, I've started to gain, gain, gain prominence uh, from uh, vendors like uh, Databricks um, and making essentially the, the point that these two notions, the ideas of a data warehouse and data lake really need to come together into a data lake house architecture where all data can be made available for analysis, whether it's for the purposes of BI reporting or for data science and machine learning, where one security model can go govern uh, data at all levels and, and even fine-grained role-based access controls can be put in place. Uh, and of course, you then end up supporting use cases across uh, you know, multitudes of users, uh, both on the BI as well as on the ML uh, domain side of things. Latency is reduced because again, you're not making copies, you're not making physical copies and, and moving that data around from one system to the other. Uh, you are delivering higher quality data uh, uh, to, to that uh, analytics environments and the updates are turned around faster again, because you know, you're not waiting on, on those data movement uh, to occur through those brittle ETL pipelines. So again, um, data, data lake houses, you know, early days, uh, but a lot of promise in terms of you know bringing these two worlds together, collapsing these two worlds together to make it more compatible. Uh, but we also know that despite uh, best effort, um, and and again, I know this is early days for a lot of organizations. That you know, seventy percent of the organizations want to be more data driven now, yet 95% of them still struggle with operational challenges around data and analytics and 88% continue to be hindered by legacy technology. So we know that legacy technology is not going out anywhere. Um, there is uh, applications that power sort of your operational environments, you know, still sit on the big mainframes, you know, there's still, uh, you know, you still have uh, applications that have been homegrown and homemade for certain industries uh, and to replicate their data model and their process workflows uh, is an ongoing challenge. So uh, ultimately that struggle to bring that insight from some of those systems uh, also combined with the fact that, you know, we are now operating in a, in a multi-hybrid cloud environment, you know, where applications are sitting across different cloud environments uh, just makes those challenges, you know, a lot more a um, lot more uh, harder for, for companies as they embark on this journey of, of uh, gaining more better insight and democratizing data and insight to, to more users. And, and really when we look at it um, in terms of where those points of friction still remain when it comes to sharing data and knowledge broadly, it kind of fundamentally boils down to you know, these five buckets. So if you're a data and analytics practitioner, you know, these, these five areas, uh, the categories should resonate with you, right? From a data culture perspective, we still operate with the mindset that we got to bring all data together. So the focus is on big data operations, just focuses on data collection, focuses still on data centralization, um, you know, control in the hands of specialists. Uh, and that data culture obviously uh, is, is something that, from you I mean, from from past environments, if you think about it, that was sort of the model that people had when when they talked about centralizing everything into a massive enterprise data warehouse, and that still propagates throughout um, a lot of this new modern stack, um, you know, infrastructure rollout. 
data models themselves are tightly coupled and shaped by the underlying data storage infrastructure. So at the end of the day, it's all about how do you optimize the type of information that you want to deliver to certain users um, and it's optimized for writing your queries. So it's, you know, even though the data may not be represented in the real world this way, but it has to conform to some third normal form in the database in, in your traditional uh, DBA modeling paradigm where, you know, the relationships between tables need to be you know, one to one, one to many. Um, and then, and then it's still very much IT driven, IT driven, driven exercise. Data integration still very much fundamentally more about ETL and ELT pipelines. You got to make physical copies and, and have those physical copies shared across different systems. Data interrogation is still very much driven by, you know, this creation of this notion of tell me what queries you want. We will create those queries for you. Uh, and those queries, of course, will be limited to processing data within a single database. So again, this notion of data centralization uh, and, and optimize, optimize queries for that system uh, and, and, and sort of notionally identifying what queries, do you, basically what questions need to be asked up front before that, that uh, you know, query is actually created and written. And then from a data intelligence standpoint, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of work that's gone into the whole data catalog domain. The idea of, you know, capturing the technical metadata separately, uh, making users available, you know, sort of have, have visibility into to what metadata is available. Great, great start, but it's still very passive in terms of the analytics and the value it delivers. It's a great place to catalog all the information, uh, but there's no real way to activate that information to, to drive uh, recommendations, right? So those are the challenges in terms of where those friction points still remain. And if, uh, if I may be bold enough to, to drive and, and discuss some of those opportunities uh, that, that are uh, out there for, for organizations as they embark on their data analytics journey, you got to create a culture of data, of data that is focused more on, less on data collection, more on data connections, because that's where context lives, that's where value lives, is, is, is between two entities and how they connect and relate. It is about federating data, not centralizing it. It is about sharing data, not controlling it. And it is also about focusing more on what we call white, white data. And white data essentially means that data that sits across domains, right? So you may create your central domain specific, uh, you know, notional, views or, or cubes, uh, but ultimately, and, and optimize for best performance, but ultimately where the value sits is in being able to connect the dots across these domains. Um, data model, again, abstracting out the data model from the underlying data structure and representing it through concepts of business meaning, so business concepts through a semantic layer enables data uniformity and linkage that's an important aspect of how a data model needs to be thought about, right? So decoupling the data model from the underlying data infrastructure uh, so that it's not shaped by the underlying data, but it's shaped by the, the, the value and how you as, as the business persona uh, interpret data and information, right? Just the way we are as humans, we know we to ask for, we think about customers and suppliers and assets and products, you know, and, and SKUs representing that in the semantic layer uh, in a way that has business meaning is the, is a, is a, is the opportunity essentially to think about uh, to, in constructing these data models. And of course, there's no one model that suits everyone, right? So how do you, you want a semantic layer that can enable uh, and support a multitudes of users and multitudes of use cases where you may shape the actual data model to fit your business need at the end of the day, utilizing the same underlying data, right? So you're not making copies, you're not creating cubes, you're not creating any of that. Data integration, well, not everything has to be moved and copied over. Data virtualization offers us, you know, a lot more power now in terms of the being ability to limit data sprawl, you know, being able to limit complex data pipeline development, and frankly, also enabling access to data that is more, more just in time or real time to support faster decision making. So 
you know, there is reduced latency when you are looking at data that's sitting in an operational system, combining that data that sits in your analytical environment versus making physical copies of that, waiting for that to, to, uh, to occur uh, and, and process before you can actually look at that information. Data virtualization comes a long way in supporting that. And of course, enabling better, you know, faster search and discovery, uh, where you can actually run complex queries across a heterogeneous set of environments. So you're enabling more search-driven data exploration rather than forcing some predefined query execution. And then lastly, from a data intelligence perspective, it's really about inferring relationships to drive intelligent recommendations because you're now linking the metadata and linking that up to the semantic model itself. So it becomes more active in terms of its uh, usability and value to the underlying data analytics infrastructure. So that's the, those are the set of the opportunities. I did want to reflect on this. This is really enabled through uh, what we call a knowledge graph powered semantic layer uh, and really facilitating sort of that last mile. So uh, Lake House has come a long way in bringing all of that data together, bringing the two, colliding the worlds between your traditional data warehousing and data lakes. Um, the knowledge graph powered semantic layer is sort of that next uh, level up uh, in, in terms of uh, delivering value back to, to the, uh, the users that need it the most and, and looking at data in a way that they conceptually understand uh, and how they relate in context of their specific use cases, right? So, uh, so in, in you know, Gartner put, put this uh, put this comment uh, out there uh, as part of one of their reports. In a data fabric, one of the most important components in the development of a di of uh, a dynamic and composable and highly emergent knowledge graph that reflects everything that's happened to your data. And this core concept enables the other capabilities that allow for dynamic integration and data use case orchestration. Uh, and, and we firmly believe from a perspective of where knowledge graphs play a central role in the data and analytics ecosystem, this is really part of that data fabric foundation that a lot of companies have started to embark on. So what is an enterprise knowledge graph? It's really a flexible semantic data layer for answering, answering complex queries across data silos, very simply put. Of course, this is where we unify data and metadata using the semantics uh, layer that's that's in place, you can it becomes a living thing. So you're actually evolving the semantic layer as part of your data fabric, and you're delivering more context and rich data because you're able to infer new relationships and new meaning from you know just logically connecting the dots. If A equals B, B equals C, A is likely to equal C, and that knowledge and inference. Uh, can 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 be driven to back to the user as a set of recommendations or push pushed back into your own existing systems and workflows. So let's look at it from a real life example um, in the context of of life sciences. Uh, this is an example of a, of a major uh, life sciences pharmaceutical company. You know the big challenge that they were trying to put that they uh, were working with and dealing with was the sort of lack of broad availability of internal and external data for decision-making by critical stakeholders. You know, so who are the critical stakeholders? These are folks in the research area, clinical development area, their commercial area, the safety area, and the regulatory area. So these were the different stakeholders. And of course, you know, the types of questions uh, or the issues or challenges that ref they were, were reflected in each area within that uh, organization was sort of the, 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 the impetus to, to embarking on how do we, bring data accessibility, solve for the data accessibility problem. And whether it was on the research side, trying to under, understand the average you know, months it takes to, to target, identify, and validate something, or from a clinical development perspective, you know, trial design and execution time, cycle time can be faster. And how do you, how do you make that faster? From a commercial perspective, you know, sort of missing omni-channel framework, uh, or limited coordination between Salesforce and other channels from a safety, you know, adverse reaction perspective, understanding, you know, what's, uh, how do we investigate that adver adverse uh, uh, effect of a particular medication, um, you know, wh wh where all this data sits and this information and knowledge sits across different systems. And then from a regulatory perspective, you know, just getting, you know, all the information data that's needed to, to get regulatory approvals, how do you make that process go faster and much more smoother? 
And that's sort of where, you know, this is again, a high level pictorial representation of, of the set of challenges where again, data that's both inside the enterprise, but also data that's external. Uh, and the, the really the end state, and I wanna bring the end state right up front was bringing a lot of this data and information and co-locating that within the data lake house was sort of the step number one for them. Well, as they called it uh, as part of the enterprise data fabric and then building a semantic layer where, so the, the foundational layer was great for all the data curation, all the data deduplication, um, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and having all the data co-located, um, that became very important for them within this data lake house foundational layer. And then the semantic layer became this sort of area where they harmonized data and brought all of the insight from the various domains at the semantic level where the business users who really wanted to benefit from this, you know, in the context of their different departments of so research, understood what molecule components were, what compounds were, what studies and trials were, reg what regulatory meant, what toxicity meant, what adverse effects meant. So they could go ahead and ask those questions much better than they would otherwise, right? So at the semantic layer, they're able to connect the dots between the effect of uh, you know an adverse effect of the medication to down to the actual set of compounds and what those compounds uh, in fact are where they might be used in other medications uh, that may have other similar effects uh, on on the consumers themselves so being able to create that um, and support the different stakeholders was certainly step number one uh, what was also important was that they were able to reuse this platform to scale uh, the sort of the digitization across the entire drug development process. So, so from R&D to preclinical, to clinical, to regulatory, to post-market, they were able to put together these domains as, you know, as part of the, the, the entities that they called within the semantic layer. So drug target identification, compound repurposing, scientific search, drug target validation, auto reporting, adverse effects, traceable supply chain, all of that was linked up together in order to support these you know, infectious, infectious disease planning. All of these were able to uh, um, bring the sort of the entire knowledge of not only what researchers were doing, what studies were being conducted, conducted but also what compounds were being utilized, what medications were involved, uh, you know, who were the suppliers and when was the last set from a supply chain perspective, from a distribution channel perspective, connecting all the dots became a, a critical value uh, creator for, for the organization itself, which meant they could then begin to ask questions like, are certain genetic conditions suitable to be treated with a particular drug? Could a gene expression be used as a biomaker to understand whether the drug is a, delivering an effect? Which compounds have been tested in similar conditions with similar treatments? You know, show me all the, lot, all the lots of raw materials and associated suppliers involved in the production of a finished good lot number one, two, three. How do COGS for product and compare between these two regions and which manufacturers have supplied the raw ingredients involved in, in a particular customer complaint? So again, looking at it sort of more holistically as part of the enterprise data fabric, bringing this knowledge that's connected across both these internal and external sources, they are now able to, in a position to ask and answer these questions uh, much better than they have, uh, they've ever been in the past. All right, so again, so you, you're, you're democratizing the knowledge to more people, more users inside of the enterprise that don't necessarily have to come with some sort of specialist skill set uh, in, in order to, to look and, and look through this information and, and, and uh, understand the entire data supply chain. So with that, I'm gonna pause here and I'm gonna pivot over to, uh, as I promised, uh, uh, an actual live demonstration of how this would work. Of course, I wanna take this extensive uh, use case that I've just shared with you live here, uh, but, but, uh, but a very simple one. Um, and then again, a different industry, in this case, an insurance one uh, to get the same point across uh, in terms of what it takes to, to build one and to get started with one when you're when you have a lake house foundation in place how do you kind of activate that from from a semantic layer to support uh, a whole host of use cases so let's get yeah i'll get right into it a few things um uh, you know th this is an insurance example so kind of uh, 
mimic a, an insurance risk analyst, you know, who's looking at data and information that's currently sitting across different silos. Uh, they need a complete profile of the customer's financial situation, including all the assets, you know, what vehicles they own, maybe asking questions like, you know, what's, uh, what, what risk is associated with the flooding and fires, et cetera. And for the purposes of this particular demonstration, um, the Stardog platform, which is our enterprise knowledge graph platform, uh, has, uh, has materialized some data from some CSV files, from a JS JSON file, and also will be virtually, virtually connecting to data that's sitting in Databricks. So if Databricks itself will be the source of the data and any queries that get asked will create push down queries as, as, uh, as part of the SQL endpoint that Databricks recently released. So actual, uh, actual compute is happening at the source. So we're not copying any data into the, the knowledge graph from Databricks in, in this scenario. So let's get right into it. I'll uh, switch over here. And uh, let me see if I can move this around a little bit. Okay, so I am connected to our enterprise knowledge graph platform in the cloud. It's our AIWS hosted offering. Uh, we have three different applications here. Explorer for us to be able to view data that's that's been connected, all the knowledge that's been connected. Designer is actually where we're creating a no-code visual environment for, for creating and maintaining your knowledge graph, <clears throat> sort of your knowledge engineering process. And then we also have an IDE for, uh, for more advanced uh, system admin users as well as advanced users who want to be able to look at uh, the underlying data infrastructure, uh, create their own uh, queries and write their own queries. So that's an ID for, for that purposes as well. But I'm gonna jump right into um, Stardog Designer uh, to give you a flavor for how we would, you know, someone would go through this process. And we'll create a new project. Uh, we'll call this, um, so for the purpose of webinar, I'll just use the webinar name. I'm going to, uh, so I am connected to uh, the Stardog server in the cloud. I'm going to pull in a model that uh, uh, has already been defined working. So you can imagine working with different users. Um, uh, this model was put in place. Um, so we'll bring that in. And what you're, what, you're, what you're seeing here is, you know, a basic model that talks about insurance data that's coming in from the claims management system customer data from the customer system, uh, insurance policy from the policy admin system, you know, along with address information and quotes that have been created for that particular user. So the idea here is that you've sort of some, you know, created this sort of business meaning driven model that is representative of the type of information the users are interested in uh, and value, right? So, and each of these bubbles kind of represent the entities or the specific business concepts. And then there are specific attributes attached to this. For example, for claims, I've pulled in amount paid, date of loss, policy number. Uh, for the customer information or insurance policy, I have the policy number and the premium information and maybe even some uh, information related to the quotes themselves. Now, what I've also done, like I said, is I've preloaded some of this data into the knowledge graph from some CSV files, from a JSON file, and I can start to actually look at this information already. So if I go back into my Stardog cloud and go into Explorer, and uh, I'll pick up an example. I'll connect to the same database, of course. So I'm going to connect to my demo underscore Naveen Sharma database. And let's say I pull up a customer, let's say Bob Styles, search. And I see Bob Styles is here. I see all the information related to Bob, um, you know, date of birth, email, label, owns certain information, what claims have been paid out. And I can also start to kind of explore this in a graph visualization way. So I can kind of see cost Bob Styles is a type customer. So I'm actually tying the actual instance of this customer class or customer entity. So this is the metadata at that level, almost the vocabulary and the ontology. Um, uh, different ways of, rep, uh, of saying the same thing. This is an instance of one of those. It just happens to be Bob uh, at that address, you know, with specific claims that are associated with that individual. So I can again already explore some of this data. Now, what uh, what the insurance risk analyst wants to know is, you know, what assets 
are associated with particularly with Bob, the assets being you know, vehicles in this case. And I've been told the vehicles exist inside of Databricks. So I'll go back into my designer environment and start to kind of look at ways that I can bring that into my model itself. So part of it, this is I'm gonna create a new class. Um, I started to kind of do that. So we'll call this vehicles. This is a description again for the specific um, business concept that I'm interested in. And I will pull in some MSRP data, we'll create that. And I might even put in some model information in terms of what model car vehicle it is. And so I've created basically a simple class with two attributes, uh, nothing to it. Uh, and then uh, I may want to be able to say customer relationship, customer owns vehicles. So I pull that in. And that's a relationship I've established between the two. And that could be, you know, again, customer owns uh, the, the vehicle relationship. And what I want to do, I want to be able to pull in data and virtualize that from my knowledge graph. The other thing, um, and I'll, I'll get to it as well, um, is within my Tableau report, uh, I already have access. So one of the things we were able to do is actually push this data into the systems that you're most familiar with. So there is a, uh, a BI SQL endpoint that makes the knowledge graph look like a SQL source. So if someone wanted to pull the same information into a Tableau report, um, you know, they're able to kind of do the same thing. Um, so that's another way uh, if someone wanted to look at this information. So I have the same classes, entities, address, claims report, customer insurance policy quote that were represented in my knowledge graph as business concepts are available as tables here. So if I pull, for example, one, one of these, um, I can kind of see the specific information related to that. So this information is coming directly from the knowledge graph uh, as well. Now, if I will go back to my Explorer, I wanna now create, a, add a new project resource. This time I'm gonna pull data in from Databricks. Um, this is an environment that's sitting in a separate cloud. Um, Azure, and I'll pull that in, call this uh, resource Databricks, and I will select um, from insurance.insurance underscore vehicles. We'll see, make sure this is actually something we can fulfill, and this is active in the table. And depending on whether or not this particular instance is up, and this always is an interesting time to see whether I can actually pull some of this information or not. Now, good news is this information is up. This information is available to me, so I can see the model, the color of the year, the mileage, sales price information has been verified and validated. So I can create this resource and bring that into my semantic modeling layer. And when I do this, this is the exercise of me kind of beginning to map that out. So if I wanted to start mapping this information out to my vehicle, I can start to do that. So let's go ahead and map that out. Let's call this um, mapping one for now. And we will map that to the vehicle. And here I know what my primary identifier is, is sort of this um, ID. And I'll go ahead and map the model from the actual Databricks table to my semantic class that I've already defined, the business concept. I've also had the sales price come in and I'll map that to the MSRP. Um, I'll set the label so you can actually look at it as a model name. Uh, we'll stop there. And then I'll also create another mapping here to identify the actual relationship so that I can make that connection as well. And we'll call this uh, your owner ID, map to the ID itself, and that relationship is established. So I have that model in from, uh, from Databricks. Uh, this, this becomes a virtual source for me to now look at this information. I can go ahead and publish this uh, out to my startup server. And that, you know, and ask me where I want to publish this. I'll go ahead and publish this within the same demo that I've created before. I'll publish this out. 
And that uh, is now uh, published. So now if I go back into my um, Explorer view, um, I can start to pull some of this information back in. Of course, um, I need to probably refresh this. Uh, so we have this information connected to the source. And actually just from the, from an experience standpoint, I'll go ahead and close this out so you can walk through the same experience we did before where we start from a particular user if I wanted to do that. Again, I'm connecting to the same database, uh, which I could have refreshed, but let's go ahead. So it's customer, this is Bob Styles, and we can search this. Same thing here, we start to search, look at information. As we're doing this, I'm also trying to connect here and make sure all my settings are connected. So I know I have a, I have a default graph in place. Uh, I have a model in place. So we'll use that webinar one. So we'll save that. And um, what I'm starting to look at is information from the virtual source. And, and as see as the model, I can look at a particular name graph. Uh, again, the notion of name graphs are ones that the, that have been created for my specific use case, which in this case, I don't have one. So I'm gonna just go ahead and use that particular one. And that generates this sort of virtual view and connection back into uh, the particular graph that I'm pulling in. In this case, I model this in terms of the webinar. So I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna go back and say, okay, I wanna look at, you can see I have the vehicle class defined. Before I did not have that defined. So if I look here for customer, same thing, Bob Styles. Uh, let me see, I wanna make sure I have all the data in here and it's refreshed. So I'll go in and look for particular one. Oh, sorry, I forgot I didn't refresh this actually. The other thing I also started to see if I go back in here in my Tableau, the same information that was available for me running before, I can start to see that showing up in here as well. So now I've pulled in the same information that was sitting in my knowledge graph, now pulling in information from the actual particular database as well. So there's different levels of ways I can connect to this. I can virtualize this and, and, and show this through my Tableau. I can also connect this through my Python API and make it available uh, inside of my data science notebook. And if I go back here, sorry, um, there's multiple ways I can come at it. And then for more, more from a research perspective, you know, this is again, a user that, you know, that may not have access to either data science notebook or BI Tableau, but actually wants to start to explore data. It's so again, a very simple use case of being able to do that um, through, through the lens of, of Stardog Explorer. And one of the other things um, in, the, in the essence of time, I'm not gonna really work on right now, but to wanna make sure you understand and you can see from, from this perspective here, and I'll pull up these slides. You can also run what are what's called inferencing. So in the case of inferencing, I'm actually able to connect uh, and infer relationships. So where I may have a relationship where taxes were assessed for a particular address that is owned by a customer, I don't have to have this physically <clears throat> manifested in my semantic model as a relationship that's expli explicitly defined. What I can do is actually run inferences based on a rule and rule says customers who own an address must owe the assessed value of those taxes. And so having that in relationship inferred the fact that these taxes were assessed for an address that belongs to this customer, we can actually get in for a relationship that customer owes these particular taxes. So that's the power inferencing actually running <clears throat> on the semantic model where these relationships don't have to be explicitly, explicitly defined in the semantic model itself. So going right into it. So this is again, you know, the talk throw the notion of where you can actually supercharge your own analytics, right? So I gave you a very simple, basic example of a Tableau report or uh, uh, a very simple view of the type of data I have in my specific model. Of course, you have other information, you know, things like when it was built, what the property was assessed for, 
what type of insurance uh, risk uh, are associated with that particular location, you know, in terms of floodplains, risk zones, again, external data that you're pulling in. And that information can be researched and searched through the Explorer view, can be utilized inside of a reporting tool like uh, Tableau, or within your own data science notebooks as you start to build machine learning models to our Python API. Uh, moving right along. So really the, the goal here is to help close the, the last mile uh, with a knowledge graph powered semantic layer. Uh, the three key, key takeaways here for you is to understand, number one, you don't have to bring all that data together inside of a centrally located repository. Uh, you can still include all the data you need. Some of that data absolutely can be virtualized without making physical copies. This is very, uh, this was very helpful when you want to, you know, support ad hoc data analysis uh, or look at addressing uh, you know, some new what if scenarios or new challenges. And you, know, you don't have to go through the whole exercise of you know, extreme pipeline development. You again, model the way you think, right? So you think about the world a certain way uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, the, the business concepts uh, and that's how you create that model sort of in a whiteboard style, uh, canvas style model development exercise. And that becomes your semantic layer uh, and it's it's sort of abstracted out from the actual underlying data structure. And then you're able to uncover new insights. And these insights can leverage, you know, against uh, logical inferencing or statistical inferencing using machine learning uh, to infer new connections between the data, uh, regardless of, you know, what the, where the domain is and, and help you uncover new patterns. Um, what does it all result in? It results in outcomes, frankly, from all the analysis we've done working with our clients improving productivity of your teams, both on the data analysis side, as well as data science side, you know, develop, you know, making sure that you can bring new products and services quicker to market. So there's a shorter time to market aspect and potentially uh, create new avenues of revenue resources or uh, revenue sources for yourself. You know, so new revenue streams that get uncovered. And again, all of that is only possible when you can bring the knowledge of all that data that is available and connect that knowledge up to the semantic layer and deliver it to the people that are making those decisions that don't have to necessarily be the experts in a particular technology uh, or frankly, even you know, experts in you know, something as basic as writing SQL code, right? So, um, so I'll leave you with that thought. Um, I think uh, from my perspective, uh, this is sort of the last slide here, helping really modernize uh, your analytics. Uh, Supercharger analytics is a key use case of, of a knowledge graph powered data fabric, accelerating um, your investments in data lakes um, and the lake house uh, as, as you may have done with, with Databricks and the likes uh, or your Amazon um, AWS S3 and powering sort of what we call semantic search based exploration. This could again be not just through the tool that I demonstrated, but it could be within your own application through a GraphQL based API, uh, as many of our customers have done within their own homegrown or uh, COTS, COTS applications and power recommendations and recommendation engines, right? So knowledge graphs are great at, at you know, bringing, bringing together knowledge um, as we talked about, even just from a pure data and analytics perspective, inferring by linking metadata to the data, you're able to drive new recommendations uh, as well. So uh, I'll leave you there. Um, Shannon, uh, this is a, probably a good time to see if there are any questions I can answer. Uh, and certainly uh, happy to answer as many as I can with given the time we have. I mean, thank you so much for a great presentation. There's lots of questions coming in. If you have questions for Naveen, feel free to submit them in the Q&A portion of your screen. Uh, and just a reminder, and to answer the most commonly asked questions, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording, along with anything else requested. So diving in here, um, with respect to the case study presented, what was the time frame for integration and implementation? Yeah, no, that's a great question. We typically find that most customers, uh, and frankly, whether they're thinking this way or not, our sort of prescribed approach to tackling these challenges is certainly coming at it from a lens of what are the business outcomes um, they're looking to achieve and you know what part of the organization. So when we talked about the different stakeholders, the research group, the clinical group, the commercial group, I mean, we, we almost look through the, the organization and say, who's got the most to lose by not having access to all this data? 
what analytical insights or what types of questions are important in driving that outcome or value to the business. And then looking at it from that perspective and that lens and saying, okay, what's the specific set of business concepts that they would be most interested in, regardless of what the location uh, or, or structure of that data is. So again, approaching this from a use case centered um, you know, creation of a, of a data fabric to then evolving it to a larger enterprise data fabric that can promote some more reuse and share. So we, we see anything typically from um, six weeks to three months, you know, and enabling a set of use cases to, you know, projects that, again, depending on how much they want to bite off of uh, at, a, at a single go, uh, can take, uh, you know, a couple months for the next use case and then a couple months for the third use case. So. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So um, how does the tool interface with data catalog tools? Um... Yeah, data catalog tools are, are um, certainly the companies who've invested in data catalog tools. You know, we, we don't want them to, you know, you, you have um, start from a blank canvas, right? So the, the power of having a data catalog tool available like a Calibra uh, or like a Unity data catalog that, um, Databricks just recently launched, for example, those data catalog tools can serve up some of the metadata that already has been classified uh, as the basis of the specific business concepts that we're going to model. So if a business glossary is in place, for example, and you've already made a definition, you have already defined a customer, you've defined a supplier, you defined an asset, we can ingest that certainly uh, to, to fast, to accelerate the knowledge engineering process. And that's a great way for tying then the underlying metadata in the data catalog to the actual model that will, will get queried by the user at the semantic level. And so when those queries are coming in, there's a bi-directional value back into the data catalog because we can now sh share you know, which, which business glossary items or concepts are being referenced most, how often, by who. Um, and, and then Oftentimes when a particular business class or concept is being asked, what other business concepts or classes are being re uh, returned in terms of the, the query response itself. So that kind of pushes that knowledge back into a data catalog so that they can kind of promote um, uh, the value there uh, where, where they're collecting everything and anything about that, the, that specific metadata. Uh, other ways that we've seen clients benefit this is to be able to look at how do they how do they expand this um, to look at the entire data universe? So sometimes, data, depending on which data catalogs you're using, you know, you're not able to really visualize and expand out all the data that um, that connects through the majority of these systems. Uh, so, so being able to visualize it as a, as a knowledge graph is a great way to be able to to bring that that data catalog view um, in front of users in terms of value. Awesome, and so many great questions here. I'm gonna try and get to as many as possible. Um, so with respect to environmental and social and government uh, or governance, what to what degree can a data lake house facilitate an organization's ability to better monitor and manage energy consumption and carbon footprint reduction? Okay, you, you have to restate that for me one more time. Yeah, sure, it's a mouthful. <laughs> um, with respect to um, environmental, social, and governance, to what degree can a data lake house facilitate an organization's ability to better monitor and manage energy consumption and carbon footprint reduction? Yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day, that's, the data lake house is a great collection point of a lot of that information that's being gathered. Um, that knowledge then has to get enabled and 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 in the hands of the right folks that make those decisions. So being able to take all of that knowledge and data, tie it to into the semantic layer and make that available so that it can be actioned upon by the users. You know, I mean, we, we have uh, organizations that do data sharing sort of as part of open data standards. And this is a great way, great, great way to kind of promote both a, you know, a, 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 an ESG type um, uh, ontology that, defines them as common, you know, um, classes, class definitions or vocabulary that can be shared by all companies looking at this in the way they, um, uh, in the way they report that information, in the way they consume that information, in the way they collect that information. So having it at that level makes it, makes it that much um, 
easier. And then of course, uh, data sharing, because now you're able to, you know, again, as part of maybe an open data initiative, you know, you're able to make that available as a, set, you know, as a set of knowledge graph queries that can be asked and answered, right? So, you know, where are we in terms of progress? You know, what, what more has to be done? Who's, who's behind, who's not uh, provided information? You know, what information is available? All of those questions can be easily and readily answered. Oh. Awesome. Great yeah, way to thank really you. Drive, like an uh, open data initiative or open data consortium around ESG. Lots Love of opportunities it. there. Yeah. Um, what is the difference between a data lake and a lake house? Yeah, I mean, look, at the end of the day, uh, this is uh, maybe at the top of the presentation I touched upon. Um, the key fundamental difference that you know we're seeing in the market, data lakes are great in terms of co-locating a lot of data together, you know, they still have challenges in terms of um, uh, latency. Uh, they still have challenges in terms of uh, security uh, that, you know, at, at least at the fine grain level, role-based access control um, and in quality, right? So quality of data is still questionable because yes, you, you storage is cheap and data lake is great because data lakes allow for bringing a lot of data um, on the cheap uh, in one central location, um, but you know where they still lack value, you know value or or um, lack the ability to to deliver value is, you know you still don't have good governance uh, on top of it. You still can't um, fully recognize all the metadata that's available um, for for use. Uh, what the quality of that metadata is, uh, and then and then of course the latency challenges of of you know putting that linking that up into some sort of an operational system or reporting system that can query all this information in ways that um, can be readily and easily consumed by, by knowledge workers across the enterprise. Uh, so that's where I think the lake houses um, uh, certainly helped, uh, so certainly help address some of those challenges within a data lake. And of course, data, the, the lake houses are certainly a great step forward, you know, where, uh, where the semantic layer on top, you know, it really starts to address that last mile in the in the in the power to democratize data for to more users awesome i think i'm going to switch try and get in one more question here sure. um if this graphql same as a knowledge graph so graphql is a is a way to to represent a piece of what's inside of the knowledge graph um, into an easily consumable application programming interface so when you are when you want to connect up your own applications you know think of it like a restful interface for graph type queries it's an easy way for you to have that it's a contract uh, data access endpoint into the knowledge graph now the knowledge graph itself has both a you know typically a persistence layer uh, underneath uh, but in, in a, an enterprise knowledge graph like ours, you know, while we support the ability to persist data, we also have the ability to virtualize data. So any queries coming in either through GraphQL or through, um, uh, through Tableau, through our SQL endpoint or through uh, Python and the data science notebook and the data might be sitting in Databricks as I demonstrated in this example, we're pushing down, we're taking that uh, query, pushing that query down uh, to 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 the actual source itself, uh, so without having to materialize all that data inside and persist that data. I love it. And there's some more connectivity questions here too. So if you have a link um, that I can send in the follow up for what um, Startup connects to, that'd be awesome. Yeah. You know, like does it? Um, and, and can this tool get um, content from leading from from data modeling tools such as Erwin and ER Studio? Got it. Okay. So uh, look, at the, at the end of the day, we can connect to anything that can, that, that supports open standards, uh, JDPC. We can connect to anything that um, provides a RESTful interface. Um, so, so many different ways to, to do that. Certain systems are a little more closed in and, and proprietary, and we've made efforts to connect to those systems directly. Um, but then again, we have like a whole host of 100, 150 plus connectivity options that we're happy to share as a link.
love it. And there's also a pricing question here, which is always a great um, question <laughs> and a great sign of interest. So that's awesome. And we'll get you links to those things um, in the follow-up email as well. So um, I'm afraid there's so many great questions here, but that is all the time that we have for this um, webinar. Naveen, thank you so much for this great presentation. And thanks to Stardog for sponsoring today's webinar. Again, I will send a follow-up email to y'all and to all registrants by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and recording as well as the different uh, links to the additional information you all have requested here. So Naveen, thank you so much. Thanks to our community. Love it. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.